National Association of Scholars webinar series on American innovation. Uh, today, our topic is going to be transforming the airwaves, uh, the radio. Uh, by, way, by way of introduction, I'm Scott Turner. I'm director of science programs at the National Association of Scholars, and I'll be moderating today's event. Uh, and I'm guest hosting for your usual host, uh, David Randall, who uh, unfortunately can't be with us uh, today. Uh, let me just first uh, give a short introduction to our speakers. Uh, we have three distinguished panelists today. Um, uh, Dr. Tom Lewis is Professor Emeritus of English at Skidmore College, and uh, he has a, an abiding interest in American history and culture, and uh, he's written several books, including Empire of the Air, The Men Who Made Radio, and he's also consulted, written on, or produced a number of documentary films for public television, including including working with Ken Burns on the Brooklyn Bridge uh, documentary and uh, the Civil War and uh, Empire of the Air, uh, the men who made radio. Uh, our <clears throat> second guest is Dr. Susan uh, Douglas. She's uh, the Catherine Nefi Kellogg Professor and Ar Arthur F. Thurnau Professor of Communication and Media at the University of Michigan. And she, too, is the author of numerous books, including uh, Listening In, Radio, and the American Inv uh, Imagination, which actually won the Hacker Prize in 2000, and Inventing American Broadcasting, 1899 to 19. 1922. And our third guest is Dr. Donna Halper, who's an associate professor of communication and media studies at Lesley University. Um, she also is a uh, former uh, DJ. She's a music director and radio consultant. And, and uh, like our other panelists, she's the author of several books, including Invisible Stars, A Social History of Women in American Broadcasting and Boston Radio, 1920 to 19, uh, sorry, a bigger part in 2010, uh, as well as another book, which will be the topic of her presentation today, uh, Unexpected Radio Stars of the 1920s. So I'd like to uh, welcome our guests today. Uh, before we turn things over to our speakers, uh, we have a little bit of housekeeping we need to take care of. Um, each of our speakers will go uh, have about 12 to 14 minutes to speak. And once that is open, I'm going to open the floor to discussion and Q&A. And this is going to be your chance to participate. Uh, this is really one of the points of doing these webinar series is to give you, the audience, a chance to interact with our uh, panelists and to ask your uh, questions. So. Uh, please do submit questions at any time as they come up. Uh, we prefer that you submit them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, which you can do at any time. Uh, we uh, like to do it there because it's a bit more interactive than dropping things into the uh, chat box. Uh, and finally, uh, you know, we, we, we have limited time today, unfortunately, uh, but if your questions don't get answered, uh, please do send them to me at my email address at Turner, T -U -R -N -E er at nas.org and I'll do the best to make sure that they're either forwarded to the panelists or I'll try to answer them myself. And finally, um, uh, last bit of housekeeping. Uh, uh, this event is being recorded. Uh, a link to this recording will be sent to the email address that you use to register for this event and it'll be on YouTube. All right, so let's get down to the fun part. Uh, so uh, thank all of you in the audience and our three panelists for joining us for this event. And, and so without any further ado, let me just introduce our speakers. Uh, let, let me just uh, turn it over to our speakers. And the first uh, to, out of the box is going to be Tom, Tom Lewis. Tom, take it away. Uh, good. Thank you very much, Scott. And thank you for moderating. And thanks especially to Chance for overseeing the technology behind this afternoon's uh, discussion. Uh, I always have a shout out for people who are in charge of the screen. And I, it's a pleasure, really, uh, for me, an honor to be here with Susan Douglas, an old a uh, friend and Donna Halper, whom I, uh, both of whom uh, work, whose work I know and admire uh, very much. 
And uh, the questions that were posed this afternoon, as I got them, was what's the story behind radio's development? What effects did it have, social and technological? When was it introduced and how did the development of radio lead to new technologies such as television? So I'm gonna lead off and try and give a little bit about the background of radio and the early years of radio. And uh, I'll leave uh, the others to discuss, uh, discuss most of the effects. Uh, about the background of radio, it, fixing a date for when something begins in technology is pretty hard. If you think about the wheel, for example, um, it, uh, you, you can't have a wheel, you probably think about a wheel on a cart, uh, but of course that demands an axle. It demands other things. And radio demanded the uh, investigations into magnetism and electromagnetism that began in the 17th century and lasted well into the 19th and even the 20th century. Um, in 1887, Henrik Hertz, uh, discovered the existence of electromagnetic waves and proved that point. Guillermo, Guillermo Marconi um, turned Hertz's discovery into the wireless telegraph in 1894, but it wasn't until 1897 that Joseph Thompson discovered the electron. So that sets the stage for the 20th century when three Americans build on the knowledge of these giants to create what we call radio. And lay, they lay the foundation for the digital age that we're in today. And that's, I think, ultimately the importance of this afternoon's topic. The men who did this were Lee DeForest, and he was a, an incurable and passionate romantic his mind was filled with often conflicting desires to do good, to make a fortune, to improve the world, to become famous. But he was also cynical, callous, distrustful, jealous, and often dishonest. His 20 radio companies that he created all ended in bankruptcy. And sometimes the officers faced criminal charges and even went to jail. Yet he is without a doubt, very important to the history of radio because he created the single discovery that is behind every circuit that we have today. And that is the three, he created the three element radio tube, he called it the audion. And that is the grandfather of the transition transistor and ultimately of the uh, computer chip. Uh, it is a way of regulating uh, the electrons that proceed through a circuit and amplifying them if, or uh, controlling them, I should say. Um, the second is Edwin Howard Armstrong, who understood the electromagnetic waves. DeForest did not. And he understood the Forest Audion on tube in ways that eluded the inventor of it. Um, and he created a novel way to use the tube as the basis of, for basically what he called regeneration, which was amplifying the circuit, both for listening and broadcasting and transmitting. And this was an entirely new way of communicating. Uh, and he did this in a way that created the circuits that become the basis for everything in radio uh, today. His inventions made him very wealthy at first. He became the largest shareholder in the Radio Corporation of America. We'll hear more about that in a minute. And at one point brought him additional millions from other companies. Um, but Unfortunately, he ended up impoverished, uh, without money, and ultimately took his life, as we'll discover in, in the next couple of minutes. The third person I want to bring on stage is David Sarnoff. He, David Sarnoff was not an inventor, but an entrepreneur, uh, and he had in energy, intelligence, shrewdness, and determination. And these qualities that he brought forth came 
with him from to America from a shtetl in Russia, and he first grew up in New York in the Dickensian poverty, I should say, of a New York tenement, and within. 20 years of his arrival in the United States, he was president of the Radio Corporation of America, the largest radio and manufacturing company, broadcasting company in the United States. And more than any other person in America, certainly more than DeForest and Armstrong, he understood the meaning and the impact of the new technology of radio. As early as 1916, he proposed a radio music box. And in just a decade, RCA, after that, RCA in just a decade was selling radio music boxes, radios, and broadcasting radio programs on NBC, the first national network. Yet these achievements came at a price. His personal relationship suffered he ended, and, or ended in enmity, and his, he always sacrificed everything to the, the corporation. Uh, now, after the war, uh, broadcasting came into its own, and the federal government helped create the company we know, knew as RCA. It was a corporation that gathered uh, the patents of many inventors, including DeForest and Armstrong, and, and put them together to create uh, radio and broadcasting. Combining these inventions enabled radio broadcasting that Sarnoff had long championed. And broadcasting, we want to dwell for a moment on that. That's that agrarian, um, what should I say, that agrarian metaphor of sowing seeds uh, that engineers adopted for spreading music, drama, and news and ideas across the land. Now the words of one person, a person in New York or Washington or San Francisco, could be heard across the country and across the world uh, to by hundreds of thousands or millions. Radio became the first modern mass media, one that knew no geographic boundary and uh, disrupted all the other uh, media that were in place before it. Now, Sarnoff, a serious radio, I should say, began in 1920, actually in the fall of 1920, with the broadcast of the election returns of the Harding-Cox presidential election. By 1923, radio had become the fastest growing industry in the United States. By the end of the decade, there were 600 stations, and most of them were affiliated with uh, three radio networks uh, that would be two owned by RCA and one, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Broadcasts were heard by over 12 million homes. Uh, more than 40% of American homes had radios. Over the next decade, that number would jump to 80% of American homes had radios. Now, radio came at a time, and we have to sort of put this into a context too, when Americans were recovering from a world war, from a global pandemic of influenza, uh, they were apathetic about public affairs. They wanted to return to normalcy, as Warren Harding put it. Uh, and the percentage of voting age Americans who cast ballots in 1924 was actually the less than any time since 1828. But radio offered listeners a chance for new entertainment instead of parties organized around a radio a record player, they could now be audio witnesses to public spectacles like Lindbergh's return to the United States in 1927 or boxing fights or baseball games. But most of the time radio offered escape and fantasy to listeners caught up in economic peril of the 30s, especially. There were comedy shows, variety sketches, soap operas that often tacitly affirmed the, the home as the place of moral, uh, a moral center. Uh, feminine 
domestic haven, a spiritual center for, that intersected with the world outside, the masculine affairs of the world. And the inhabitants of the radio dramas that were created were uh, working class, average people, often like the audiences that they, uh, <coughs> that they were listening. Now, by the 1930s, there were over 200 different radio uh, programs being broadcast, and this be cre created the golden age of radio, uh, which we call, we call that. But we have to remember, after we listen, think about Amos and Andy and Gangbusters and Jack Benny and uh, Backstage Wife and all those shows, that there was something else that was going on. The programs that brought America together, reflecting their aspirations and fears, on, offered them minutes of relief from personal cares. They often tacitly underscored American prejudices, especially racism. Amos and Andy is, of course, the famous example. Everyone knows two white men imitating blacks, but there were a number of others. Blackface, not black actors, was the rule. One popular program, Beulah, which was based on uh, the character of Aunt Jemima, featured a white man playing the voicing the part of a black maid. So blacks, in a, one sense, were completely without agency in, in that uh, particular example. There was hatred on the radio and the crisis in financial markets and capitalism of the 30s certainly uh, helped to fuel that fire, but hatred was there. Father Coughlin is the best example of that. His weekly Hour of Power program was the most famous. It reached 30 million people. Um, every Sunday on the Columbia radio system. And he began by actually uh, started by giving catechism lessons to Catholic children. And he soon turned it into crude nationalism and anti-Semitism. He attacked usury, modern Shylocks, Franklin Roosevelt, the New Deal, and even and praised, of course, isolationists, those who wanted to stay out of uh, world affairs. And he even sympathized with the fascists and Nazis uh, and justified at one point Crystal Knock. Fireside chants from SDR, of course, were the counterweight to Coglin and hatred. And he did, we tend to think of him doing a lot of them. There were just 30. And over the entire presidency, and they were short, most about half an hour, and some shorter. But it's no question about it, as E.B. White wrote in the, in the depths of the Depression, when the unemployment rate was 25%, when people speak of the radio, they don't mean a cabinet, an electrical phenomenon, or a man in a studio. They refer to the pervading and somewhat godlike presence which has come into their lives. And <clears throat> what happened, of course, is the inventors of radio fought like hell. And Armstrong and DeForest were the ones who were in continual and perpetual litigation. It was a fight which DeForest, law, which DeForest first lost, and then Armstrong ended up losing after seven rounds in the federal courts. Uh, two of them went to the Supreme Court. It was all over the invention of the regeneration circuit, which uh, Armstrong had invented and uh, DeForest claimed patent infringement. The Civil War, uh, the Supreme Court was actually had seven members on it who were, had been born before the Civil War. The idea of them understanding a case about electrons and the intricacy of radio transmission was clearly beyond them. They decided in favor of DeForest. And it was ultimately, however, FM that brought Armstrong down. All the radios worked on the concept of amplitude modulation. Armstrong invented a new way that eliminated static. 
which was the great uh, problem with uh, AM. And he invented it in 1933. But, and he demonstrated it to Sarnoff and proposed that all the radios be switched, all the programming be switched to FM. Sarnoff would not have any of it because uh, that would have meant the end of AM radio and 40 million radios that he had sold would be obsolete. By, and he was pushing a new medium which was television, which was introduced incidentally at the 1939 World's Fair. Uh, and, but Sarnoff had no hesitation in stealing the patents of Armstrong to create the sound for television sets. The picture of television sets was generated over amplitude modulation, FM carried the sound so that nevertheless, he infringed on the patents and Armstrong saw no money. Armstrong ultimately entered into a protracted legal battle. He ultimately died by suicide in uh, 1954. And Armstrong had been a great friend of Sarnoff's. It was a terrible tragedy for both of them, really. For DeForest, it was triumph. He said, Armstrong's dead and gone and I'm alive and well and happy. Uh, Sarnoff said, not that. Sarnoff simply wept openly. But in a curious way, <clears throat> they all failed. DeForest failed, for, his companies went bankrupt. Armstrong's failures, you can see right away. But Dar David Sarnoff failed in another way. He wanted to create a dynasty. He left his left uh, RCA in the hands of his son in 1965, uh, who Robert Sarnoff quickly ran RCA into the ground. Uh, by 1985, General Electric had taken over RCA and had become basically, basically by that time, uh, a shell of what it had been. But the vision of these people lives on. It's fair to say that DeForest, Armstrong, and Sarnoff are the forefathers of our digital age. DeForest liked to call himself the father of radio, and certainly his radio tube may be said to be the father of the transistor and the grandfather of the integrated circuits, uh, radio circuit chip. Sarnoff's RCA, interestingly enough, created the first commercial computer with integrated circuits, circuit chips. That was in 1965, half a decade before IBM. And Sarnoff had a prescience about a coalescence of computers and communication that few corporate leaders shared. In 1964, and I'll end with this, he predicted, quote, a global communications network that will instantly link man to machine. The computer world would, would affect man's way of thinking, his means of education, his relationship to his physical and social environment, and it will alter his ways of living. It would be, he said, the greatest adventure of the human mind. So these men have, the three of them brought us to the point where we are now, living the greatest adventure, and I should also say the most perilous adventure of the human mind. Thanks. Um, I'd like to uh, uh, move on to Susan, but before we do, let me just uh, remind everyone, you can put uh, questions in the Q&A box at any time. Um, and uh, we've got some uh, things coming in the chat box, that's fine. Uh, but uh, like I say, try to direct them towards um, towards Q&A. And just one final thing, I have put a link to Tom's book, Empire of the Air, The Men Who Made Radio, again in the chat box. Uh, so please do have a look at that. Okay, let's, uh, let's go on to our next guest then, uh, Susan Douglas. Uh, Susan, uh, take it away.
Well, thank you, Scott, and thanks, Chance, for organizing all of this. Um, and as Tom has uh, reminded us, radio, of course, is a history of technology, of institutions, of huge businesses, and of course, programs. But when thinking about transforming the airwaves, I want to suggest how radio transformed our cognitive and sensory environment, because here was a new medium that denied sight to its audience. So, you know, just to put us in the mood here, most of us know that feeling driving alone at night on a road or a highway surrounded by darkness and listening to the radio. There we are, all alone, yet through this device, we're tied by the most gossamer connections to an imagined community of people we sense love the same music or the same programs that we do. Now, according to experts, at an emotional level, there is something deeper about hearing than seeing, and something about hearing other people, which fosters human relationships even more than seeing them. And although radio and sound listening have been pronounced dead serially over the years, look at the explosion and devotion to podcasts. Listening matters. Now, when I started working on Listening In, I was surprised at how little had been written about radio and the act of listening, about radio and the oral culture that it revived. So I wanted to explore why the act of listening might be so pleasurable and why so many people were and are nostalgic for the radio they grew up with, whether, whether it was the golden age or listening to radio in the 1960s, 1970s or 80s. Now, remember, radio entered a highly visual culture in the 1920s. When it swept through America in the 20s and 30s, it disrupted the cognitive and cultural practices of a visual culture and a literate culture in a way that neither the telephone nor the phonograph did. By the 1920s, just remember, especially, uh, Americans and especially those in cities, took in a kaleidoscope of newspapers, magazines, billboards, advertising, posters, vaudeville shows, electric lights, and of course the movies. Illustrations and photographs had transformed nearly all printed material everywhere. There was a glut of imagery. Seeing was regarded as the most important sense, the visual privileged over everything else. And then came radio. Now, here was a giant auditory prosthesis that extended people's range of hearing to distances previously unimaginable. But radio also carried people back into the realms of pre-literacy, into orality, to a mode of communication reliant on storytelling, listening, and group memory. When radio first appeared, as you know, the three of us have seen over and over again, it was constantly referred to as a miracle, as miraculous, and as pure magic. And as hokey and naive uh, as that might sound today, it wasn't simply due to its novelty. The magic was, as I've argued, in the act of listening itself, in relying on and trusting your ears alone to produce ideas and emotions. The magic comes from entering a world of sound and of using that sound to make your own vision, your own dream, and your own world. There is something actually very primal about hearing about listening that makes this medium so compelling, so prone to being wrapped up in a gauze of nostalgia. You know, we've all heard this platitude, radio stimulates the imagination. What I sought to unpack and listening in um, is to think about this and to focus on what happens when we listen. In fact, Orality generates a powerful participatory mystique because the act of listening simultaneously to spoken words form he forms hearers into a group, while reading, by contrast, turns people in on themselves. Orality fosters a strong collective sensibility. People listening to a common voice or to the same music act and react at the same time, they become a collective entity, an audience. And whether or not they all agree with or like what they hear, they are unified around that common experience. 
So even though the visual system of the brain is actually larger and much more extensive than the auditory system, it seems that hearing's immediate and transitory quality is actually what gives it such power. The fact that we hear not only with our ears, but with our entire bodies, our bones, our innards vibrate too to sounds and certainly to music, means that we are actually feeling similar sensations in our bodies at exactly the same time when we listen as a group. So it's in part because of this physical response that listening often imparts a sense of emotion stronger than that imparted by looking. It turns out that there are probably compelling physiological reasons why people are so nostalgic for radio. People loved radio and still do, and now podcasts, because as cognitive psychologists have shown, humans find it useful and in fact highly pleasurable to use their brains to create their own images. What we call our imagination is something the brain likes to feed by generating images almost constantly. That's what imagination is, the internal production of pictures, of images. Now, studies show that people tend to remember word sequences they have generated much better than those that have been spoon-fed to them because active engagement dramatically improves memory. Now, we all know how disappointing it is to go to a movie made from a book we've read and to find that the lead characters look nothing like the vivid portraits we've painted in our mind's eye. And the more we work on making our own images, the more powerfully attached we become to them, coming as they do uh, from deep inside of us. It is this absence of imagery that was radio's greatest strength that allowed people to bind themselves so powerfully to this device. It's this feature of radio, its extension and magnification of the ear of hearing that defines its meaning to the imaginative transformations of American life in the 20th century. When information comes solely through our auditory system, our mental imaging seems to have freewheeling authority to generate whatever visuals they want. When sound is our only source of information, our imaginations milk it for all it's worth, creating a detailed tableau that images, of course, that are fed through us preempt. Now, I don't mean to suggest that we never use our imaginations when we watch a film or TV, but creating our own mental images of how things look is the much more pleasurable and a powerful uh, cognitive activity. So radio has taught us, socialized us, how to listen to different things and how to feel during different modes of listening from the interactions between who we are and how and during what eras we learn these modes of listening and we develop our own repertoires of listening. Just think of the different modes we might inhabit in one day alone, like when people listen to NPR or to talk radio or the news and now to podcasts, whatever the ideological thrust they expect us to concentrate, to follow histories, biographies, stories, and debates. This is very different from listening back in the day to Jack Benny or Burns and Allen, and certainly different from channeling into a top 40 station in 1960 to hear Dock of the Bay or Will You Love Me Tomorrow? So it wasn't just that people in the 30s and 40s were listening to the same show at the same time. They were doing the same kind of cognitive work of imagining at the same time, and they knew others were as well. Thus, radio played a crucial role in what the scholar Benedict Anderson has called imagined communities, how a nation, how the notion of nationality, of nationhood is imagined, because most people in a nation will never meet each other. Yet is it in the mind of each lives the, imi the image, sorry, of the nation. And divisions based on class, race, age, and gender aside, which of course matter, as Tom was noting earlier, people still manage, still need to conceive of the nation as some kind of deep horizontal association. Now, it was this daily ritual of, uh, according to Anderson, of reading the newspaper um, that helped create this imagined 
community. But radio broadcasting did this on an entirely new geographic, temporal, and cognitive level, inflating people's desire to seek out, build on, and make more concrete that notion of nation. And certainly advertisers and the networks seeking to maximize profits by having as big an audience as possible pushed radio to be national and promoted it ideologically as a nation-building technology. Now, and Tom referred to this as well, the sheer geographic scope that these new simultaneous experiences encompassed when 40 million people, for example, tuned in to exactly the same thing at the same time. This outstripped anything newspapers had been able to do in terms of nation building on a psychic imaginative level. Hearing the president address you and others as my fellow Americans, or Walter Winchell to call out to Mr. and Mrs. America and all the ships at sea, it tied utterly diverse and unknown people together as an audience, even, and again, to point to Tom's talk, even as subgroups of this audience were marginalized, resisted, and cast themselves against such nationalist hailings. So there were enormous contradictions in radio between uh, uh, radio creating a sense of nationhood, but also appealing to subcultural groups, and in fact, even fomenting hatred among those groups, as Tom shrewdly pointed out. By the mid-1930s, with the highly commercialized network system in place, a great majority of these voices, which sought to sound familiar, intimate, even folksy, did represent a centralized consumer culture. Obviously, people imagined what was being described on the air, but they could also picture what was not described, adding their own details and flourishes. They had to imagine, for example, the fantastical things they never saw, like the Martians in War of the Worlds. There were pleasures then about belonging to this group while standing above it. There was a reaffirming sense of synthesis of harmony and knowing that your vision of Jack Benny's vault, where he hid all his money, was in sync with everybody else's. But at the same time, hearing something rather than seeing it allowed you to hold something in reserve that's just yours, your own distinctive image and vision. Your image of Jack Benny's vault was still your own, of your own making. It was simultaneously both your creation and part of a collective vision. And this was what was incredibly important and magical about radio. <clears throat> now, just think of what we saw, and Tom alluded to this, with our ears. We saw a president, we saw baseball games, we saw boxing matches, we saw Martians landing, we saw a major war, we saw movie stars, the Lone Ranger, we saw the shadow, all through listening. But most of all, the turn to listening reactivated, extended, and intensified particular cognitive modes that encouraged simultaneously a sense of belonging to a community, to an audience, and yet a confidence that your imaginings, your radio visions were the best and truest of all, and that you would be part of a group, but you were also a distinctive individual. And I will stop there. Any questions as we speak, and this uh, serves as my prompt to remind everyone, please do put your questions in the Q&A. Um, they're starting to stream in uh, slowly, but uh, by all means, ask them. Uh, all right, so um, also I've put in uh, a link to a couple of Susan Douglas's books in the chat session. So again, please do have a look at those. And our wrap-up guest uh, on our panel discussion today is Donna Halper, who's going to uh, tell you about some of the cultural aspects of the invention of radio. Thanks. Am indeed. Okay. Yes. Um, I'm holding in my hand, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, a <laughs> diary, an actual diary from 1925. I'm a friendly media historian, and uh, just like my panelists, 
co-panelists, um, I collect stuff about the history of broadcasting. And this particular piece of stuff is an actual diary. Somebody wrote down all the programs that he or she listened to. I mean, this is gold for a media historian, am I right? Um, and it, I, I'm looking here, it's like the person listened to WJAR in Providence um, and they heard the Dempsey Tunney fight where um, uh, Tunney won, uh, very exciting. And, I mean, these are just, there's nothing deep or profound, except yes, it is. Somebody thought it was important enough, as Susan and Tom alluded to, somebody thought it was important enough to write this down because this was life, this was real life. These were our friends. And in many cases, people did think about radio as a friend. They thought about it as a way of communicating with people that they might never communicate with otherwise. They couldn't believe it. They were amazed. So let's talk about some of the unexpected stars of broadcasting. And when I say unexpected, I'm referring to the fact that a lot of people got on the air and never expected to be famous. They were asked to do a radio talk or they were asked to, you know, do a women's show and the public loved them. They didn't expect to be loved. They didn't expect to be anything. They just expected to do this one-off radio show and there they were, okay? This is Bertha Mitchell. I'm leaving my screen small for a second just because I kind of like to see people when I talk. Can you see my slides okay, even if I keep it small? Um, Bertha Mitchell never expected to be Boston famous. She was a club woman. She was a volunteer, but she was also a businesswoman. She was an executive secretary, which in those days, okay, fine, it was a gendered culture and women couldn't expect to like be the boss, but being an executive secretary had a great deal of power to it. And she was the executive secretary to John Shepard III, who was the owner of a chain of department stores, a very powerful guy. He founded one of Boston's first radio stations, WNAC. It's still around today under the name WRKO. It went on the air in July of 1922. I know what you're thinking. So what, Donna? Well, actually, yeah, at the time, kind of so what? It was one of the many stations that went on the air during the radio craze of the early 1920s. Oh, by the way, when you see this, See this thing here? It's an old carbon microphone. This tells you that the photograph is probably from 1923 or 1924, because those mics were very common back then. They also were a problem because they forced your voice up. And this is where we get the stereotype that people didn't want to listen to women's voices. I'm going to address that in a few minutes. But to some degree, yeah, the carbon mic did not do women's voices any favors. I got to tell you, it didn't do men's voices any favors either. If you didn't have a big, deep voice, you had a big problem in early radio. And this is another one of the reasons why we get the style of announcing that we get. But I digress. So Bertha is the secretary to John Shepard III. John Shepard III puts on a radio station. And they need a women's show because back in those days, it's believed that all women are housewives. Now, Bertha wasn't one. She knew that women weren't all housewives, but hey, got to make a living. So she does a women's show, does it very well, becomes wildly popular. People are sending her fan mail. Everything is very cool, except the owner of the station, the late great John Shepard III, does not want her to go on under her real name. He doesn't want any of his announcers to use their real names. Maybe they'd like get too popular. So he gives her a radio name. He gives her the name Jean Sargent. Now, Bertha becomes Jean Sargent, and I'm sure all the listeners thought she was Jean Sargent. 
And then in the middle of 1925, Bertha asked for a raise. She was doing double duty. I mean, she was John Shepard III's secretary, and she was doing a women's show. Excuse me. And John Shepard III basically told her to go pound sand. Bertha Mitchell was not going to go pound sand, thank you very much. She got a really good job in the Midwest as a station manager. Everything worked out fine. Say goodbye to Boston. Well, now John Shepard III has a problem. He has this famous star doing the women's show, Jean Sargent. And when she leaves, the next person that takes over the show is named Jean Sargent. This is where house names come from, where if you were a kid during Top 40 Radio, you may have remembered hearing a guy on the air named Dan Donovan. And then a few weeks later, you heard a different guy. It was a different guy, except his name was Dan Donovan. And you thought, am I going nuts? No, you weren't. You were hearing house names. And this is where the practice got started. But let us go, if we may to a fine example of the effect of radio creating stars. This is Nellie Ravel. Nellie was a press agent and a very good one. She was a publicist, in other words. They used to call them press agents. She also became a really popular vaudeville performer in 1905, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. She was a comedian. She did monologues. Um, here's a problem. Unless you were wealthy, unless you could buy a really nice dress or suit, and unless you were white, the chances are real good you never got to see her perform as good as she was. But then radio came along. And one of the interesting and perhaps unintentionally transgressive things that radio did was it made stars out of people who might have otherwise not been stars because of their race, because of their gender, because of their religion, as we will see in a few minutes. But Nellie Ravel goes from being a vaudeville star to being somebody who is heard nationally on NBC. She creates a character called Neighbor Nell. And come on, she's a press agent. She knows everybody. And pretty soon she's doing gossip. Okay, she was kind of a Hedda Hopper or the Luella Parsons of her era. And she knew everybody who was anybody. And she could tell you all about them. And you didn't have to get a nice dress. You didn't have to get a suit. You didn't have to go to the theater where she was. Because suddenly, she was in your house entertaining you like a best friend. Now, this is my cultural hero. This is the late, great Eunice Randall. Eunice was the first woman radio announcer in the East, and she was one of the first in the United States. Eunice never expected to be a famous radio announcer. She never expected to be a radio announcer at all. She was a draftswoman. She did not want to be called a draftsman. Long before people degendered certain terms, Eunice was real adamant in the 19 teens that she was a draftswoman. Thank you very much. She did technical drawings, did them very well. But the owner of the company she worked for, and she was very active in amateur radio, but the owner of the company, she was manufacturing radio receivers and helping with the technical drawings. The owner puts a radio station on the air. It's called 1XE. The X stood for experimental. And they needed announcers. And they needed people who could work cheap. And so the owner, Harold Power, basically went around to the people that worked in the factory and said, hey, congratulations. Would you like to be on the radio tonight? And they all were. And the one person that became radio famous in the early 1920s was Eunice. Contrary to the myth about women's voices, Eunice had this mellifluous voice. I have heard her. Her niece heard a recording that she made when she recreated one of her shows in the 1930s. Unbelievable. Okay. She was natural. 
She was just a warm, intelligent person. She read the news. She read traffic reports in 1921. Okay, 1921, 22. She was on the air for five years. And the fact that there was a woman on the radio, somehow the Republic did not fall. But Eunice became Boston radio famous. And because it was AM, like Tom pointed out, those signals, boom, all over the country. Eunice is getting fan mail and marriage proposals from everywhere. Imagine her surprise. She's getting asked to speak everywhere. And speak she did. And she spoke for herself because this is another thing radio did. It gave agency to people who otherwise had been spoken about. But now they were the speakers. And speaking of, and now they were the speakers. This is stage actor Charles Gilpin. And he, of course, had the Nellie Ravel problem, which is if you went to his performance, you could see him. But if you didn't go to his performance, you didn't have the money, maybe they wouldn't let you in. All you could do is read about him in the newspaper. But Charles Gilpin read about radio in the newspaper. And he read about the fact that it was sweeping the country. And one night, April 3rd, 1922, to be exact, one night after he got done performing on the Boston stage, he was the star of the Eugene O'Neill play, The Emperor Jones, got done performing, and he went over to Boston's pioneering station. It was one of the first in the country. You may have heard that KDKA was the first. Au contraire, mon frere. Uh-uh. OK, um, you could make a really good case for 1XE WGI and you could make a really good case for 8MK WWJ. But that's a debate for another day. One thing we do know, Charles Gilpin decided, hey, I'm right up the street from a radio station. What would it be like to do some of the Emperor Jones on the radio? And by the way, radio wasn't called radio yet. It was called radio phone or wireless telephone. Nobody knew what to call it. But whatever you called it, Charles Gilpin goes on the air that night, April 3rd, 1922, perhaps one of the first times in the country that a stage play is performed live by the star. And then he sang a song and people couldn't believe it. People were like, uh, the Boston newspapers were just like, we don't believe this is happening. We just heard a stage play on the air. Uh, and, and the guy, like the star, uh, yeah. Charles Gilpin, African-American in an era of segregation, transcending boundaries to be heard on the air performing for himself. Now, I got to talk about Charles Wagner, Charles L.H. Wagner, sign painter by day, radio poet by night. Charles Wagner had a shtick, and it was a very interesting shtick, okay? He was a commercial artist by profession, but he fancied himself a poet. Oh, my friends, I've seen some of his poetry. He is not going to make the world forget Shakespeare, I promise you, okay? But for his day, he was able to get a few of his poems published, and then he went on the radio, and his shtick was that Susan calls in and says, would you ask Mr. Wagner to do a poem about the president? And off the top of his head, he would come up with a poem about, okay, it was doggerel, okay? It really was. And I think I was just unfair to doggerel. But it doesn't matter. People loved it. People were sending telegrams, ask him to do a, you know, do a poem about the governor or about the mayor or about traffic in Boston. It didn't matter what it was. He'd come on the air a couple of nights a week and do poems. And he turned them into a book. Only one copy has survived. And Brown University has it. And I made a pilgrimage to see it so that I could like read what were the big news stories in 1924 as Charles Wagner did them on the air in poetry. Now, another thing that radio did was it brought Broadway musicals, it brought stage plays. And in the case of Shuffle Along, it opened up the possibility of, let's be honest, white people 
buying black music? Because it turned out they loved the music in Shuffle Along. It was a stage Broadway musical, 1921, perhaps the first black Broadway musical, wildly popular. The touring version hit Boston in the mid in mid 1922. It did so well. They had to like keep extending it and keep extending it. And John Shepard III, remember him, got the bright idea. Let's have Cecil and Blake and Lottie G and some of the other. Let's have them come on the radio and perform. And they did. In August of 1922, the stars of Shuffle Along came on WNAC and performed some of the songs in the show. And I promise you, the audience was thinking, is there this much wonderfulness in the world? But back to the unexpected. Let's talk about Bernie and his bunch. Now, there's your carbon mic, 1924. And there's Bernie. Bernie is really... Bernie Aegis. Bernie's a lawyer, but Bernie's a brand new lawyer and he ain't making the big bucks. So he starts an orchestra and he plays around Boston, weddings, bar mitzvahs, you name it, he'll play it. And then one night, because radio needs performers. Radio is a volunteer medium at this point, okay? You want to get, a, you know, Scott, do you sing? You want to get on the air? You know, it, that's exactly how it happened. And so it was that Bernie and his bunch went on the radio. And everybody loved them. And the next thing you knew, they were on again and again and again. And they became local stars in Boston radio. They couldn't keep up with all the bookings. Now, let's be honest. Lots of people had a hope or a dream that they, too, would become popular on the radio, just like today people want to be YouTube influencers or TikTok stars. But there's a million of you out there and there's no guarantee you're going to be a star. But sometimes it works. Bernie went from being an up and coming lawyer hoping for the best to being one of the most popular band leaders in Boston. Couldn't keep up with the bookings. He ultimately went back to the law. In fact, when I talked to his grandson, his grandson didn't really know that part of his career. He was like, wow, I had no idea he was like, you know, radio famous. I sort of knew he'd been on the radio. I was kind of surprised by it, but there it is. And speaking of surprised by the radio, this is Rabbi Harry Levy. You heard about Father Coughlin. In Boston, we had the answer. It was Rabbi Levy. Rabbi Levy got together with and made friends with a priest named Father Michael Ahern, and then they made friends with a minister. I know what this sounds like. A priest, a rabbi, and a minister walked into a... But they did! They made friends, and they went everywhere. They went everywhere teaching tolerance. Harry Levy went on the radio for the first time in January of 1924. Again, accidentally. It was like they needed a synagogue service. They had church services. They didn't have a synagogue service. John Shepard III said, hey, let's do a synagogue service. We've got some room on a Sunday. Go get them. He didn't realize that the public would warm to Harry Levy to such a degree that he ended up having to put out two books of his sermons. He was so popular, I'm, I'm reaching off camera here. I mean, here, I've got, signed by his grandson, one of his books of sermons. In 1929, he became so popular that the Boston Evening Transcript wrote an article about him and found that when they surveyed his congregation, 20% of them weren't Jewish. They were there because they'd heard him on the radio and they liked him so much they decided they'd just show up every week. And so they did. The radio rabbi taught tolerance. He taught respect for the other. And he humanized what Jews believed. He really was an answer to some of those stereotypes. I've just got a couple more. I hope I'm being halfway interesting. This is Charlie Donlin. And there's your, there's your mic. I never met a mic I didn't like. And Charlie Donlin was a cartoonist for the Boston Traveler. 
another accidental celebrity. Charlie Donlan got asked to come on the radio in March of 1925 and talk about sports. He was a sports cartoonist, no problem. Talked about sports. The show became really popular and he kept coming on every week talking about sports, perhaps the first sports talk radio show in Boston. And then he ended up being a play-by-play -play announcer and doing the play-by-play -play of the Boston Braves. His own family was amazed when I told them some of the stuff that Charlie had done on radio. He was a true pioneer. Never expected it. Never thought it would happen. And after it was over, he went back to being a cartoonist again. And here's the mother of us all. This is Lou Henry Hoover. And she was the first first lady to ever give a radio talk. Calvin Coolidge was jokingly called silent. Cat. No, he wasn't. He talked on the radio all the time. He even made fun of his voice because he had a very nasally voice. But hey, he was the president and you weren't. So he could talk any way he wanted to. Grace Coolidge, his wife, people begged her to go on the radio. Wouldn't do it. She was shy. Would not give a radio talk. But Lou Henry Hoover, she did give one. And then she gave another. And she opened up the possibility of first ladies allow being allowed to speak in public. Historically, first ladies were supposed to be in the background. Lou Henry Hoover had been the president of the Girl Scouts. She gave, of course, a talk about the Girl Scouts and about volunteerism. And she continued to do that. And she really did pave the way for Eleanor Roosevelt. So what have we learned? Well, what made radio unique in that era, because I'm a social historian, radio made ordinary people famous because it was a mass medium that could take anyone you had hope that maybe if you performed, maybe that would be you. It took people who otherwise would not have been able to transcend the place that they were performing and let them speak to millions. Because radio was live, it always needed interesting people. Who knows, maybe you'd be that person. And as I mentioned, radio was unintentionally transgressive. It gave black people, women, Jews, and other marginalized groups a chance to speak to audiences that might have rejected them if they tried to speak in person, gave them agency. Oh, I got to say, radio brought the dead back to life. The great Caruso died in 1921, but his phonograph records lived on. And just like people today, kids will hear the Beatles, and it's like, oh, will they ever reunite? Um, probably not. But everybody heard the great Caruso. They loved him, even though he was gone. And finally, radio in many ways equalized the social classes. Up until radio came along, if you weren't wealthy, if you weren't white, if you didn't live near a big city, there was a real good chance you'd never hear any of the famous people, let alone become famous yourself. With radio, it made just about anything possible. So to sum up, in the end, a lot of the radio famous people, the ones that were accidental celebrities, they went back to their ordinary lives. But their lives in many ways were never ordinary again. They were transformed by a medium that let them do things they never thought they'd be able to do. Thank you. Thanks very much, Donna. That was fascinating. Was uh, I okay? Was I all right? It was fantastic. Yes, thank you. All the presentations were fantastic. And uh, uh, again, I've put some links to Donna's uh, works on the chat page. So please do have a look at uh, at those uh, at those uh, items. Uh, By the way, for those who thought I was being kind of weird, just saying, was I all right? I'm on a panel with two people that I've admired for years. And I'm putting this out for a reason. I'm 76, still adorable, but 76. Okay. <laughs> and I still work full time. Donna, what's your point? My point is I got my PhD when I was 64. 
I went back to school when I was 55. I was a rock and roll DJ for years. I went back and, and everyone said I was too old. Oh, my friends, if you're one of those people sitting out there thinking to yourself, wow, I'd like to do that. You're not too old. You're never too old. So for me to be on a panel with people that I quoted in my dissertation, I got my PhD when I was 64 years old. And here I am with the scholars. I'm just a working class kid. If I can do it, you can do it. Just had to say that. <laughs> Thanks, Donna. So your comment about the Beatles uh, prompted the thought of me that actually uh, uh, artificial intelligence, which has everybody in a stir right now, is bringing back the Beatles, right? It's uh, and so so that's a that's a whole new dimension to uh, the creation of this uh, of this media, uh, conquering the airwaves and. Uh, as we transform into digital media and so forth. So um, let's go to Q&A. Um, uh, they're starting to stream in a little bit. Uh, there's been a couple of questions uh, uh, that have come in on the Q&A chat already. And uh, Susan, thank you very much for, for uh, uh, putting your input in. But uh, Donna, your, um, your mention, uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember the man's name right now who used to make up impromptu poems on the air. Um, yes, Charles. L. H. Wagner, the radio poet. Yeah, well, we had uh, an interesting response from uh, one of our listeners, uh, end user, and uh, he composed his own little poem, and I just thought I would uh, read it out. It's in the chat page, uh, and he says it might be a crime to take little time to make up a rhyme, not worth a dime. I hope I read that uh, read that the way you intended it, uh, end user, whoever you may be. Um, so we've had a couple of interesting uh, uh, thoughts here. Um, one of them uh, came from uh, also end user. He says, I've always found the call letters of the older AM radio stations to be interesting. Uh, as a youngster, the local power station in the Twin Cities was WCCO. Only much later did I learn that the letters came from Washburn Crosby uh, CO. I don't know if that means county or company. <laughs> and that company made General Metal Flour, which is now known as General Mills. So, uh, and th there were a couple of other questions about the origin of call letters. And uh, I don't know when this was standardized, uh, but uh, any comments that you might uh, be able to shed on this history. I think uh, uh, our listeners would be interested. I can <clears throat> certainly do that, but I don't want to step on my co-panelists. Did you guys want to say anything about that first? And then I'll be happy to leap you, in you and start. tell you what I know about why, it. Why don't you start? Okay. So there were two ways to get call letters. The Department of Commerce, which th there's no FCC yet, okay? There's in 1927, there's going to be the FRC, the Federal Radio Commission. But prior to that, the folks that supervised the fish also supervised radio. It was like the Department of Commerce and Herbert Hoover. Now, back in the days of the Titanic, once the law went in, the radio stations had to be on board a ship. And by radio stations, I don't mean stations that play the hits. I mean stations that can let you know if you're about to run into an iceberg. Um, those stations had call letters. And when the ship sank, the next ship didn't want those call letters, thank you very much. <laughs> and so it was that there's this stockpile of call letters. And as I understand it from a couple of radio magazines that I read, um, what the Department of Commerce did was they took some of those call letters and just handed them out to the new stations. So that's how WBZ, which had ori originally been a ship radio station got to be WBZ. So that was one way to get them. The Department of Commerce handed them out for the most part sequentially, WAA, WAB, WAC, et cetera, et cetera. But you could also request call letters. WCCO is an example. In Boston, we had WEEI, the station that Charlie Donlin was on. WEEI stood for Edison Electric Illuminating Company was owned by the Edison Company. Now, in Chicago, WGN was owned by the Chicago Tribune, world's greatest newspaper, WGN. <laughs> now, a lot of owners 
tried to retrofit a slogan. They took requested calls and then, you know, they didn't get them. So they took the regular calls and just kind of created something. We have one in Fall River, which is to the south of Boston, WSAR. And it was just a sequential call, but they retrofitted, we sell advertising results. <laughs> Ew. So a lot of the KFWB keep fighting Warner Brothers. No, it was a re was not a requested call. But long story short, most call letters were just handed out. But there were a few that stood for the company that owned it. They were requested from the Department of Commerce and the Department of Commerce was fine about just here. You want them, you got them. So that's what I know. Barbara Susan, any thoughts? I'm um, uh, just... Just to add to that, that um, as um, uh, once the um, FRC uh, was established um, uh, and which was then, um, you know, uh, absorbed into the FCC, um, stations West Mississippi started with a K, the one yeah. exception being KDKA, <laughs> and stations to the east of the Mississippi started with a W. Yeah, there was an exception in Alaska. There was a, a W call in Alaska. Hmm. Yep. It should have been a K. Oh, yeah. You, you were kind of grandfathered in. If you had a traditional call, they kind of let you keep it. Yep. Yeah. yeah. That's about I can't add any more except to suggest and tell you that some of the initials were very nice. There was a socialist leading station in New York City, which was W E V D D W Eugene V Debs. And uh, but everything that Susan and Donna have said is absolutely right. There was an optometrist in Washington, DC, who bought a station, and it was W M A L. M. A. Lisi, which was that was the name of the optometrist. It was great yeah. publicity for him. Uh, we we see, like I said, we see some of that. Okay, and but most of the other call letters, pretty much, you know, you asked for them, you got them. But if you didn't ask, you got what they gave you. Yeah. So uh, um, I, all of you have have. Uh, spoken about uh, radio as this kind of uh, entrepreneurial social uh, medium and uh, Susan's already uh, typed some things into uh, in, into the Q&A session. Uh, John Lawrence Bush asks, could the panel describe in greater detail who took the lead in starting, starting individual radio stations around the U.S. and Canada? And he specifically asked, what steps did they have to take? In other words, what was the procedure to starting a radio station in the 1920s? What did what hoops did you have to jump through to be able to do that? <laughs> I got tons of things to say, but I talk too much. I worry me to death. <laughs> um, is would someone like to get started, and then I'll jump in? Well, what you are it, it sort of follows on what you were saying about some. Um, companies starting radio stations. Um, to, to give you several examples, uh, in uh, Schenectady, Albany, there's a WAMC, a public radio station, which is uh, now a public radio station. It was uh, W Albany Medical College. And what they were doing was broadcasting um, ways of taking out an appendix and that sort of thing. So it was a lot of health related broadcasting. And uh, so uh, there were those, and then there were people, uh, companies uh, like, for example, WGY again in Schenectady, which was a 50,000 watt station, which uh, uh, took its uh, wireless, general and electric, a uh, general electric, and the last would be the Y, the last letter of Schenectady. So that became WGY. Uh, other stage, other uh, companies, uh, especially newspapers, started their own stations uh, because 
that was they it was felt that it would be an extension of what they were uh, doing uh, in uh, in uh, journalism, uh, and then you have department stores. Everybody's trying to get a, a a piece of the action, if you will, because radio is becoming extremely popular, um, and then you have people who take over a station and change the letters. Uh, I can give you an example of WHHH in um, Warren, Ohio, which stood for Helen Hart Hurlburt. She owned a radio, she owned a newspaper and she wanted to extend it, but she also had an enormous ego and she wanted to name the radio station after herself. Which was remarkably common back then. Mm -hmm. um, during the radio craze, let me just see if I can get this up here. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, that's Marie Zimmerman and her husband, Bob. Marie Zimmerman was the first woman in the United States to own a radio station. Her husband, Bob, built it. But he was real adamant about the fact that Marie was the one that ran it. And when reporters would come to him and try to talk to him because he was the guy and he was, oh, no, 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 I got nothing to do with it. I'm just the city electrician in Vinton, Iowa. OK, I mean, we both love radio. I built her a station. She wanted it. She got it. She runs it. And so she did. And she ran that station for about 14 months before they ran out of money. My point is, in the radio craze, 1922, 23, when you suddenly went from about 10 stations to like 500, everybody and their mother wanted to own a radio station. There were radio stations in people's houses. Irving Vermilia couldn't afford a studio, so he put a radio station in the living room. His wife comes home from shopping one day and finds a soprano in the living room singing. And she's like, uh, why is the soprano in our living room singing? I'm not making this up. OK, no. um, he, he couldn't afford to. I mean, these were just small business people. These were it entrepreneurs. These were just local people. These were folks with a dream. Back to that whole dream thing. It was like, why not start a station? Here in Quincy, where I live, um, Harry Sawyer had a station in his little electric shop. He sold like parts for radios. And then in the front room, he had a station. Now, most of these stations didn't last. They were taken over by big corporations that had deep pockets and money to pay the talent. But for a certain period of time in the early 20s, you never knew what you were gonna hear. It was a giant adventure. You might hear somebody great, you might hear somebody awful, but in many cases, you were hearing local people who just had always wanted to own a radio station. So the answer to who started them, yeah, some of them were started by entrepreneurs. In other cases, they were started by big corporations. Up in Canada, somebody mentioned Canada, um, some of the first stations had affiliation with newspapers or had affiliation with the government in some way. But there was a great limitation about how many stations could go on the air in those early days in Canada. In the States, it was like a free-for-all, okay? Anybody that could get a microphone up and build the equipment and, you know, some people put a radio station in a truck and they just drive the truck around. So it really was for those first few years before it became more corporate, before the Radio Act of 1927, a lot of stations came and went. It was a more exciting, more adventuresome time. Some of those stations lasted. Most could not compete with the NBCs and the CBSs and the General Electrics and the RCAs, but they had some fun while it lasted. If I could add to that just a little, uh, just a bit more, uh, I think uh, everything everything you say is is right. I just want to amplify it. Please. That I think that uh, we have to make a comparison between early radio and early computers that were home computers, just as in the seventies, the or really the eighties and 
90s, people were making their own computers. You could buy a magazine and make your own uh, make your own set. Make your and you the same was true with radio. There were people who would have the knowledge with enough knowledge to build a little station. Absolutely. And uh, so a lot of it was homegrown and a lot of it was ingenious in the, the way there were lots of workarounds, if you will. But I think the, the connection really is to early computing. It was a, an exciting time. And I think that's what uh, Donna was saying. And you know what's sad about it? Because there is something sad about it. We get nothing. The, because of the fact that audio tape and transcriptions and easy and cheap ways to record the early years of radio don't exist. Mm. There are so few early broadcasts that have survived. Yeah. The only way we know about a lot of this stuff is from the newspaper accounts, from accounts, oral histories, and in some cases, if the person like Eunice Randall did, made a transcription later on to recreate her broadcast. But when I read about Marie Zimmerman, I mean, if I had eye teeth, I would give my eye teeth to hear Marie Zimmerman broadcast. And by today's standard, she probably didn't sound so great. So what? <laughs> People back then had nothing to compare it to. They just couldn't believe that they were hearing something in their living room that was like, oh, my God, I can't believe this. You know, I mean, we take for granted yeah. Yeah. the fact well, that I, you know, we have a million different ways to see celebrities. Yeah. And there's Nellie Ravel talking about some famous movie star. And you're sitting in your living room like she's talking about my favorite movie star. <laughs> and we have nothing. We have no recordings of any of that and that breaks my heart yeah. it just i guess partially technology mm -hmm. but partially and susan touched on this yeah. for whatever reason radio has been like the poor stepchild of research we have had so little scholarly research about those early years and it's a shame because it was a period of such innovation well, uh, 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 while we were talking, uh, our uh, a viewer, uh, Roger, uh, had his hand raised. Uh, he waited very patiently, uh, but he's taken it down. But what I'd like to do is to encourage Roger, please uh, do put your question. Oh, here it is right here. Uh, I think it was about uh, advertising being uh, illegal from the beginning. If there's another th point you would like to uh, contribute, Roger, please, by all means, put it uh, into the into the Q and A. But uh, people while we're... were working their way around that, oh please, okay, as early yeah. as 1921, yeah. uh, stations were finding ways to work around the no advertising. Herbert yeah. Hoover, uh, who, as all of my panelists know, was you know director of secretary of the department of commerce and he said he didn't want any direct advertising on the air and all the owners that were trying to pay their bills were like yeah fine you come to our house and pay the bills okay <laughs> so people were getting their records from barter and they were doing what national public radio does today advertising mentions except they're not called that they're called underwriting mentions you know mm -hmm. this we're very pleased that Steinert Piano has contributed these records. So let us tell you what a great store Steinert Piano is. Uh, technically not a commercial, but yeah, yeah. it kind of was. But so, we also need to remember that advertisers themselves were very cherry of, of advertising on the air. They, um, you know, there was the whole, you know, the home is a man's castle. And there was deep concern about backlash around advertising. And, uh, you know, that began to wear away, you know, when, you know, WEAF, you know, according to legend, you know, ran the first kind of ad for uh, a, an apartment complex uh, in New York. And then you began, you did get indirect advertising, you know, with the happiness boys who were pitching happiness candies, but they never said buy happiness candies, the Clico Club, Eskimos, all of that. 
but advertisers were as um, resistant to advertising on the radio as many people were. And of course that changed over time and especially changed um, once production went to New York, the networks got their grip on things and advertising agencies began to take control of radio production itself. And then you just got direct advertising. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, and by the way, thank you. I, I really am glad that I bow before you because it is true that that thing about the uh, real estate uh, company being the first, absolutely a legend. Um, I have evidence in writing that Boston radio station WGI did an ad, did a series of ads for a car dealer in April of 1924, and they got slammed by the radio inspector who told them if they ever did that again, they would you know, get taken off the air. But we know it was happening. And yeah. maybe the folks at whatever the real estate company were, WEAF had the money to publicize it more. But in very quiet ways, stations all across the country were trying to find ways to pay the bills. So it was the owners that were trying to do this, how the advertisers felt or how the agencies felt. But the government certainly had bought into the idea that they didn't want direct advertising. Yeah. And, uh, and there's this it's... push pull going on. Yeah, and of course, it's still a minefield, as uh, as Anheuser Busch has uh, has uh, pointed out. So, oh, yeah. uh, anyway, there, there are a number of fascinating conversations and uh, questions in here. I tried to get to uh, most of them, but again, let me just uh, reiterate that uh, if you have a question that uh, that that we weren't able to get to, uh, by all means, send it to me as uh, at uh, Turner at nas.org. So uh, before. Before I uh, go to the uh, panelists for some last thoughts, let me just uh, take care of a bit more uh, housekeeping. Um, this uh, this webinar, of course, is uh, sponsored by the National Association of Scholars. Uh, uh, we're a fun group, so if you're not a member, I'd like to invite you to join. Uh, and uh, if you're already a member or simply you want to go the extra mile, you could uh, donate a bit more, but mainly what we would uh, like to encourage you to do is to uh, visit the links. Uh, also, feel free to share the videos of these events with others and uh, tell uh, them all about us and about our, our panel. Um, one final item of housekeeping, uh, I just want to put in a plug for uh, future events uh, on our on the National Association of Scholars. So on the 22nd of August, uh, John Bainbridge and Ashley Shlevinsky will be joining me again on the next American Innovation webinar. And the topic this time will be Winning of the West, the Revolver. And uh, I'll be putting the uh, link to register in this in the uh, chat box. And then finally, uh, on the 17th of August, just two days from now, uh, we're going to have a special episode of Restoring the Sciences, uh, which where I'm the usual host. It will be Mark Stallman of the Digital Life Institute. And he'll be he, uh, Mark will be talking about what he calls the new trivium. And if you're classically educated, you'll know what the trivium is. And uh, is it time for an update? Uh, who knows? Mark will tell you, but join us uh, two days from now, 3 p.m. to find out. And I'll be posting the link to this event uh, on the chat box as well. So uh, with that, let me just turn to our panelists. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, um, uh, let's uh, uh, take this opportunity for you to give us some closing thoughts. Tom, why don't you go first? I, I guess I have to, to go first. Yes, I thank, please. I thank uh, you, Susan and Donna, for your remarks. Uh, I find that the unexplored areas of orality are absolutely essential to explore. And I've been given new thoughts about that. And I'm thinking a lot. I've just been rereading the Iliad, and I've been thinking a lot about oral composition and uh, how that works, and how it res and actually how it resonates even in uh, radio. Certain oral tropes that continue uh, throughout. Uh, throughout long-running radio programs, so you'd understand and hear the same phrases uh, over and over again. So that was, uh, and your 
ideas were uh, excellent. And Donna, I thank you all, especially for uh, bringing up the two black uh, people that you brought up uh, in your uh, talk. I uh, had not known that. And it's, and it's kind of interesting because it uh, adds another dimension. What's interesting to me is that those black uh, actors uh, walked in off the street, more or less, uh, and, and uh, did their thing. It, I think when you got into a more structured environment of a radio station and a national broadcast, I wonder how far they would have gotten in the uh, areas of in the tacit uh, segregation that was uh, a part of the world at that time and a part of our oral world. Um, I find well, it that's especially- That's one of the things that was transgressive about radio because you had somebody who was black performing, Bessie Smith performed on radio, Bessie Smith, the Empress of the Blues. She performed on a Southern station. They made her go up the back entrance, but, but she right. performed. And yeah. she was heard all over the South, including in places where she would never have been allowed to perform. Yeah. That so is that kind that, of thing happened. Yeah. Anyway, I thank you for that, and I'll, I'll leave it at there. That. Thank you. Susan, any final thoughts? Yeah, just to pick up on this theme, um, because, you know, radio, like so many institutions, was such a fraught and contradictory institution. And, of course, there was enforced segregation, um, you know, on the network. You know, I, it wasn't until I believe the late 30s that um, black musicians could play as part of bands on the radio. Uh, and of course, we have Amos and Andy, a, a very complicated radio text. Um, you know, was it racist? Of course it was racist, but it also did other kinds of very interesting work um, that was not solely racist, but that's a whole other conversation. But to pick up on, um, you know, Donna's examples, despite the uh, segregation on the radio, Bessie Smith absolutely got on. And when she would get on, white people would call and ask for where, who were the records? Can we hear her again? Louis Armstrong got on. Fletcher Henderson and his band got on. Um, Duke, Duke Ellington got on. Count Basie got on. And because, you know, because radio denied sight to its audience, this was a blessing for Black performers. And what added to it was that the music that these people were playing or performing were blues and jazz. And it wasn't just black folks that liked that music. You know, white people began listening to it. And, you know, you, uh, you know, I did some interviews with people who remembered when they first heard jazz on the radio in the late 1920s and early 1930s, played by black performers. And they said it was the most joyous music they had ever felt. So radio was a mixed bag, but it was, I agree with Donna, that it had um, very much, despite <laughs> the edifices that were set up by the networks by the 30s, it had its transgressive elements around race, around ethnicity, uh, and around gender, um, just to cite a few. So I just wanted to pull both what Tom's points and Donna's points together on that score. Thanks, Susan. And uh, Donna, last word goes to you. Yeah, a couple of things. Um, thing number one, um, one of the things that was interesting with respect to the other, agreed, there were gendered, there were racial, there were stereotypical representations of what people could and could not do. Like, like I said, Bertha Mitchell was a businesswoman, and yet she was supposed to like do this women's show and talk about recipes. Nothing wrong with talking about recipes, but she couldn't be an announcer, okay? And there was this unwritten rule that announcers were men. And interestingly enough, you saw Charlie Donlin in one of my slides, 
wearing a suit and tie, because even though it was the invisible audience, the owners expected you to look professional. Thank you very much. So the women wore kind of gowns and the men wore suits. And so, yeah, it was gendered for real. OK. And unfortunately, when the networks took over, it got much worse for women. There had been women announcers at a number of stations all across the country. Um, Corinne Jordan in St. Paul, she was the program director of a radio station in Minneapolis, St. Paul, okay, KSTP. As soon as the networks came along, and we saw a lot of this. But on the other hand, we also saw exceptions. We saw Halloween Martin, the first woman to do a morning show OK, she took requests. She took dedications. 1929. And yes, Halloween Martin was her real name. Yes. But those were the exceptions. Radio to some degree. Yeah. KSTP in St. Paul. Absolutely. Um, there were exceptions. But by and large, radio to some degree reinforces that, like, it's OK to have black musicians. It's not OK to have a black announcer. When I got on the radio, 1968, I was the first woman in the history of Northeastern University to ever be on the radio in 1968. Mm -hmm. There's something sad about that. Yes, yes. It's yeah. unfortunate that the Eunice Randalls of the world were considered the exceptions. The, in the 1930s, the Dorothy Thompsons and the Catherine Cravens, they were the exceptions. But if you wanted to do a women's show, you were fine. If you wanted to be a big band blues singer, you were fine. If you wanted to go outside of that, you were not fine. But I'm going to leave you with Harry Levy, because Harry Levy wrote a book, The Great Adventure, and he always looked at life like a great adventure. He was living in a time of anti-Semitism, brutal anti-Semitism. But he went on the radio and he humanized the other. He taught tolerance when nobody would do it. He stepped up when nobody would do it. And he stepped up because a Christian, John Shepard III, decided that, hey, why not have a rabbi on the air? And I never want to do a talk about all the problems that radio reinforced without also talking about there were a few heroes. There were a few people who stepped up and said, yeah, we should have a show about tolerance. Yeah, we should have a woman announcer. Yeah, we should have an African-American doing something that you wouldn't expect. There weren't enough of them, but they existed. They still exist today. And life still is a great adventure, said Donna, who's a cancer survivor. I'm happy to be here. It's a privilege. Thanks for having me on the panel. I know I wasn't your first choice, but I hope I did okay. Ooh. I really wasn't. Yeah, they were, there was somebody else that was, he couldn't do it. So they asked me and what a privilege. Well, 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 Thank thanks, you so much. Thanks to the three of you uh, for a fascinating discussion. I, uh, and I think I will just close off by a, a comment from Becky G. And I'm looking closely at the emojis there. She said, thank you all with lots of hand clapping emojis. So on that note, uh, thank you all for joining us for today's American Innovation webinar. Uh, it will be on YouTube very quickly. And by all means, share widely with your friends and uh, maybe even people who disagree with you. On that note, uh, thank again to you all, and uh, we will bid you adieu for this episode of American Innovation. Goodbye. Thank you.